Hello. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Can you help? Okay. All right. So, my name is Prashant. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Striga. We previously used to be called Lastbit. And last year, we shipped the world's first ever lightning powered payments device, this little thing, here in Europe, which basically was a proof of concept to show that you can blend two different payment networks, which was namely Lightning and MasterCard, to achieve a better experience in terms of settling money between different financial institutions. So what this little device was able to do was you could send money to people via Lightning and have it be funded from a MasterCard, or you could pay at any regular POS terminal using Lightning, uh, even if the merchant didn't accept it. So the rest of this talk is, I mean, it's a pretty short talk, and. The idea is it's, it's really just an honest story of what it takes to build uh, a new type of payment network and, and what's actually, what actually goes into building a payments network, right? So I've been building this company for about five years now, and I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to sum everything up, which is basically like two decades of experience, like force-fed through a, a tube into your throat in five years. And um, so, yeah, so jumping right into the beginning, um, I grew up in a small lower to middle income class family in India and I've been studying computer science my whole life, had an affinity for computers and uh, about six years ago I moved to Switzerland to, to pursue a master's in computer science at a top tier university and I'd already been working with Bitcoin for a couple of years at that point and the, the most, like, this is where the problem started to evolve, right? So as soon as I got to Switzerland, there was no way for me to open a regular checking account. I'm what you call a third country national and I couldn't I, I, it was basically impossible to open an account to be able to pay my tuition in time. And the most obvious solution was I ended up actually moving money from India to Switzerland using Bitcoin to, um, to facilitate the transaction. And that's sort of how the company came to be. And so the rest of this talk is mostly, uh, I hope this like, is, is able to deliver some level of insight into folks here that are striving to build new companies and shows you the sheer amount of opportunity that does exist in the space today. All right. so. What does it take to build a payments application today with fiat money, right? So there's, I'm just going to compare and contrast to show you like what it looks like um, with, a, with, with like a traditional fiat stack and then with the Bitcoin stack. So starting with a, the with a traditional fiat stack, uh, please keep in mind as well that this is an overly simplified version. There's about 15,000 pages of documentation that takes into, like that goes into actually trying to understand like what, what each of these sections mean. And I'll try to break it down one by one in short, in short bits. So starting all the way at the bottom, if you want to do anything that touches fiat money, you must have a license to do so. And the word license is something that's thrown, over, it's thrown around way too easily uh, in this industry, and I've seen it quite often, where folks don't really understand what it means to be a licensed entity and to run a licensed entity. You can either sit all the way at the top of the stack where you buy a pre-built solution, which is, like, which is generally the industry of banking as a service, and you pay obscene fees to access this whole stack, which is pre-built to do one specific thing, which leaves very, very little room for innovation. So if you want to build like a Venmo or a PayPal type of application, you usually sit all the way at the top of the, up, top of the stack and you pay someone to handle all this stuff for you. Or if you really want to try to build something cool or something that actually adds value to people, you probably want to own some portion of the stack or the entire stack itself. So let's, let's, like, let's take Europe as an example and start all the way at the bottom. So now you want to be a licensed entity Applying for a license or being, being given the right to actually operate fiat money on behalf of other people entails basically 400 plus pages of documentation that is drafted by lawyers and your internal compliance teams, which you as an, as an owner of the company must understand line by line. And you're basically telling the government, like, look, I'm going to do exactly what's, what, what I'm writing here, and if I screw up, you can come back and audit me and put me in jail or worse. Right, so the level of personal liability and risk is often quite misunderstood when folks are talking about licenses and owning a licensed entity. Now, once you let's, let's assume you, you cross the, the licensing hurdle, at, at least in Europe, this can be broken down into a whole different, whole different categories. I mean, a whole bunch of different categories. The first one could be something as small as a financial institution. The other one can be uh, an, a payment institution, an authorized payment institution, a small payment institution, an electronic money institution, et cetera, and all the way up to a, a VASP. And each of these entails like various different levels of risk and gives you various different levels of flexibility in doing what you want to do. And I, again, this is from first-hand experience. Like, we are now a licensed entity, and the sheer amount of pain and like, trouble that we went through, it, like, honestly, no company should ever have to go through that. Um, so once you, once you like get your license, the first thing you want to do is add in the most simple banking feature. So you want to provide your customers with checking accounts or IBAN numbers, as they call them in Europe. So if you want to add banking 
this, this is what is broadly in the industry called as core banking, and this is basically the set of software that talks to the central bank of your country in able to be able to, to be able to provision accounts. And usually this is in the line, I mean, this is in the realm of 10 to 20 million lines of code, which is the obscenely complex software that takes care of all the ledgers and reporting and all of these various things that you probably don't want to build in-house. Um, and there are various companies that provide these things as a service, which is sort of like a free market. And at this point, you've already spent, or you, you're sort of like at the stage where you're spending 1.2 million, at least at least 1.2 million a year to keep your company alive. And this is way before you've even had a product, way before you've shipped anything, and you're still sort of like shooting in the dark. Now, the juiciest part of the presentation, or the thing that I really want to focus on are the payment networks, which are Visa or MasterCard, Discover, Amex, stuff that you all are probably familiar with, and the way these actually function. So the way these function in comparison to Bitcoin, which is purely like, I mean, this is something you can go on the internet, download and run and be a part of the network on day one, uh, as opposed to like a closed loop payment network or traditionally in the industry, these are called as walled garden networks. And um, if you want to be a part of the Visa or MasterCard network, the way this works is it's sort of like this super elite club to which you need to gain privilege or you need to prove that you have the right to play in this club. And this is primarily driven by the principle of net settlement. This is because transactions don't settle instantly and they take time to settle, and in that period, you must absolutely prove that you have the right to, like, you, or the, rather that you have the funds and the capability to settle these transactions at a later point in time. So, for example, when you go to a shop, let's take the traditional example, you go to a coffee shop and you want to pay for something and you swipe your Visa card, what's actually happening is two members of the Visa network are communicating, facilitated by this thing in the, in the middle called a processor. So, the various types of licenses or, like, memberships that you can obtain with a card network, uh, I mean, the, two, the two, two broad classes are on the acquiring side and on the issuing side. The acquiring side is where the merchant um, or the, the POS, like the person who's providing the POS terminal or the company that's providing the POS terminal has a license with Visa directly or indirectly, which is basically saying like, look, I've, I've conformed to your ISO 8583 standards and the Visa integrated circuit specifications to be able to secure this person's card data and transmit it to your network in order to figure out if this guy has enough money or not. So Visa broadly has these like um, two broad, I mean, has broadly these two classifications of licenses that people can apply for, uh, which is called a principal license, and you can either be an acquirer or an issuer. So when you actually go swipe your card at a coffee shop, the acquiring bank, which is a member of the Visa network, talks to Visa and says like, hey, can you route this payment to the guy who issued the card and figure out if he has enough money to pay for this thing or not? And Visa manages this gigantic routing table, which is a centralized institution, and they have this huge like table of which bank issued which card, and then they relay that message on to the, uh, the bank that issued the card or the financial institution that issued the card in the first place to figure out if this person has enough money or not. And then if it comes back as a positive, the transaction goes through. And this is what is called as an authorization. So if you pay, I don't know, $10 for your coffee at this point in time, it doesn't mean that the merchant actually gets those $10. These transactions are settled at a later point in time. Like I said, this is the principle of net settlement. So either this can happen in an hour, a day, or a month. And this is why transactions are often reverted or you can have chargebacks and, and various things like this. So uh, as I mentioned, like, there's, like, so that's like where you start with um, when you want to plug into a card network. And this has like various subclasses of other, let's say, like Visa has, has spawned so many different industries. It's quite insane the size of the, 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 size of the whole card, the card issuing market, right? So there's a whole subclass of, industry, like subclass of companies that exist called processors. Marketa is probably the most famous of this, which is like this huge company that, whose entire job is to not handle money, but build the software that relays these messages from the acquirer to the issuer. And Idemia is a good example of a company that actually manufactures these physical cards. And to do this, you need to be, again, a part of the Visa network, and you need to conform to what is called VIS, the, these Visa Integrated Circuit specifications, to be able to securely store card data on a specific, on, on this chip, right? And then this is, again, a centralized point of failure because the way that is encrypted is using SHA-1 and RSA, which is, which is pretty old in this case. And um, if those keys are leaked, that entire set of, an entire batch of cards that was um, issued can be compromised. So that's, that's like the next step of the payment stack. So you have your license, you have banking, and you have payment issuing. So now there's this whole class of category that's, that deals with fraud prevention. And this is an absolute must have if you're operating any sort of financial institution. There's way too many bad actors out there. And for example, just yesterday, N26, this popular German bank, posted a net loss of 172 million euros. And this was purely because they needed to beef up their compliance teams and their fraud teams. 
because with, with, once you issued a card, you, there's all sorts of ways to, to mess around with it and, and try to screw over the person that issued the card. So when, when it comes to fraud prevention, you're basically looking for these companies that provide you with massive data sets of information, and data is money, and you pay huge amounts of money to actually access this, and then you run various sorts of algorithms against, um, against patterns of traditional card, card payments and various, various other payment type of, I mean, various other classes of payments to figure out if a payment is legitimate or not before you approve it. So this is like generally how the traditional fiat payment stack is, is, is structured. And up, up until this point, like if you look all the way at the top, by the time you have your, by the time you like end up implementing all of this stuff, you're about $10 million in the hole. You barely have a, I mean, you have a product which is not shipped. You haven't onboarded a single customer and you have no idea if this thing is even going to succeed. And this is what it takes to build in a, in a regulated industry such as card payments or like regular banking channels, right? And the reason this, this is like, the reason this especially irks me is when we built that device to power lightning payments, it wasn't technically complex. It wasn't technically obscurely complex, but then it took us two and a half years to jump through all of these hoops with Visa and MasterCard to figure out if they would let us do anything that touched Bitcoin. It went to the point of, like, we, like the company name used to be called LastBit, and we couldn't get the .com domain, so we changed the name. But um, it went to the point where the, the, the card scheme said we couldn't put the company logo on the card just because of the word bit in it. Now they've completely changed their stance, and Visa and MasterCard are like, oh, we love Bitcoin, we love crypto, please come to us. So it's, it's quite funny in that sense. And, and naturally now, well, on the next slide, yeah. This is not something that's, that I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're all familiar with this, but if you try to take that entire stack that I just showed you in the previous slide, and you compress that all into like one single layer, and that's completely free, open source, and you don't need to talk to a single annoying sales guy, you don't have to sign a single legal contract you can download and run in a day, that's basically what a payment stack is. And this is the reason why Bitcoin is so special, and, th and this was the reason that like, I really got into the space in the first place, right? So the only, the only sort of sad part about this is that these, these two networks fundamentally operate on different currencies, and back when I started, the stats were something about 0.3% of the world or something had... Um, had understood what crypto was or owned some crypto, and now that stat is up to 1.2%, which still, which still sort of shows that there's like a huge, huge room to build stuff that blends these payment stacks together. And, and Lightning is especially, is especially cool here in the sense of if you look at the, the way I described the Visa network in the past and, and this principle of net settlement, it actually takes care, it, it actually takes care of a lot of the, the shortcomings of traditional card networks in the sense of there is instant finality, there is no chance you can, ha you can ever have a reverted transaction. I mean, there are, there are various shortcomings as well. And when it comes to, like, for example, routing, you have Visa that's a centralized institution that manages a gigantic table and knows, like, where each payment is supposed to go. So it's not a routing problem there. But, but when you want to route in, um, in a directed graph of untrusted participants, this is a classical computer science problem that is still, like, unsolved to this day. So from that regard, if you are able to take this stack and the previous stack and actually bridge them together in a sensible way that can potentially serve the rest of the 99% of the world that still doesn't like own any crypto or Bitcoin. It's, it's a huge and it's a massive opportunity that's just waiting for someone to like actually take it. And here's one example of what this could look like. And this is sort of like the, this is just one example. Is like, this is, there are many ways you can approach this and various companies have taken various different approaches. But for example, what we've done is if you, if you know when a visa transaction is coming in and you can control that moment of authorization, you can actually find a gateway into the Bitcoin network. So what, you, what we've built is a set of like secure tools and systems to like take care of all the ledgering and like connecting to the banking systems, the compliance stuff, onboarding your users, et cetera. But what the, cool, the really cool part is, for example, you can fund um, a card transaction at the time of a transaction. So you can go swipe your coffee shop at a card and have a lightning invoice displayed on the POS terminal, and you can pay it right then and there, and then the transaction goes through the Visa networks, the merchant gets his euros, you're paid with lightning, and you're happy. And this, again, is, is like this class of people that would want to pay with Bitcoin, and that's like a whole other argument in, its, in itself. But then this provides ways for, like, it provides tools for companies that want to build new and cool stuff without having to go through that entire hurdle of trying to bridge the two payment stacks. And lastly, I mean, this is sort of like a way, this is one approach how these tools can be effective in powering various types of applications that would use, um, that would use this entire stack of regular payments uh, that, that are blended with Bitcoin. So if you are able to create an entirely modular system where 
you have users, currencies, wallets, accounts, and payment instruments that are completely separated from each other. And anyone that's building anything can sort of like pick and choose what they want to use. Only those parts need to be compliant with whatever law is relevant in that, in that regard. And especially with the new um, MECA regulations that are set to take place, I mean, that are set to come into effect in Europe over the next 18 months or so, this is going to drastically change the game for any new company that wants to do anything with crypto. It's basically going to look like the first slide of payment stacks for crypto companies. That's kind of a sad thing to see. So at the end of the day, like, the reason I started this company was basically to try to, to, try to build a better payment system that helps people pay faster and cheaper without having to jump through all of these various hurdles and not have to go through like this third country national onboarding stuff when uh, you're dealing with multiple fiat currencies. And I just hope that these tools are able to inspire some of you all to build interesting things that can actually benefit the world. So thank you.